Again, I'd like to say welcome, beloved friends and family, to the Gathering the Fragment series. Uh, today's message is entitled, Most Precious Thoughts. We're going to be taking some time to uh, focus on a few very significant points of that most precious message that the Lord sent in the year 1888 through elders A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner. Now, I'm going to let you know from the very offset of this video that this study is not uh, to be an exhaustive study by any means. We're not going to exhaust the themes, beloved. We're simply going to uh, whet the appetite. All right. We're going to touch on these subjects as I as I studied this message and as I continue to study this message, because truth is ever unfolding. As I continue to study this message, there are specific points that uh, stand out strikingly to me, specific points that touch me personally, uh, that I've come to value and that have come to impact my life in a very special way, as well as those with whom I've been sharing and who have been sharing with me. Beloved, I think that God's people in this generation need to have the desire kindled. And that's all this series is for. It is to kindle the desire of God's people to uh, want to study into that message for themselves, to want to take advantage of the resources available to us at this time for themselves. Beloved, there is no minister who can ever do the work for you that God desires you to do personally for yourself. The Bible said in Zechariah chapter 10 and verse 1 that the latter rain would come to every one grass in the field. Beloved, as a one grass, as an individual in the field of God's vineyard, have you taken time yet to delve into these truths? If not, my hope by the, by the grace of God is to whet the appetite in this study so that we would begin to look into it for ourselves. Beloved, uh, the message again is entitled Most Precious Thoughts. And indeed, these thoughts from the most precious message that came in 1888 are in fact most precious to me indeed. We're going to begin in the book of Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 91 in paragraph 2, with that most familiar statement regarding the message of Jones and Wagner. And as we're reading this statement, uh, we're going to spend some time breaking down the various components of the, the, the statement itself so that we may better understand what it is we're dealing with when it comes to that most precious message of justification by faith. We are told the Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through elders Wagner and Jones. Now you'll notice with me on your screen that I have given the numbers one through four for the different components of this particular part of this quotation. Point number one, Jones and Wagner were not the originators of the message they carried. The message did not come from Jones and Wagner. No, the quotation says the Lord in his mercy sent a most precious message through those men. But the message came entirely from the Lord. It originated entirely with the Lord. The message in and of itself had not one point of human devising. The role presented, beloved, was entirely of Christ. It was Christ who originated the message. It was Christ who sent the message. In fact, we have studied and we have seen that Christ himself is the message. And the reason I bring up this point is so that we can understand the way that we treat the message, the way that we treat the messengers, all right? tells us a lot of what we think of our faithful high priest. It tells us a lot of what we think of Jesus at this time. The way you treat the gift will always reveal your heart, your thoughts, your mind towards the giver. And so, beloved, let us take the time, this window of opportunity that we have, because I believe that's what it is. It's a window of opportunity so that we may accumulate the experience that Jesus needs us to have in order to vindicate his character, in order to stand at the passing of the National Sunday Law, in order to answer the world and to give them a reason, to give every man a reason, the Bible says, of the reason of the hope that is within us. Beloved, we need to take time to understand these things. Point number two, the message that the Lord sent is called a most precious message. Now, is it called a most precious message simply because the thoughts conveyed in the message were most precious? No, beloved, certainly the thoughts themselves were treasure, amen, a feast of fat things. They were certainly most precious thoughts. But the point that I want us to understand here is that that message, which came in 1888, was sent by the Lord from precisely where he was in the year 1888 when he sent it. Now, as Adventists, we know, according to Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14, that unto 2,300 days, beginning from 457 B.C., ending in the year 1844, October 22nd, right? 
Christ would move into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary for the purpose of cleansing the sanctuary, cleansing a people for the day of at one the preparation of a people who have received the marriage oneness with Jesus Christ. Now, from October 22nd, 1844, on to this very day in the year 2020, on this very Sabbath, Christ has been in that most holy apartment of the heavenly sanctuary. The question is, where was Christ? In the year 1888, when he sent that most precious message, he must have been in the most holy place. Thus, the message coming from that very place is a most precious message. Point number three, the message as it came in the year 1888 was addressed first to his people. Now question, why did the message of Jones and Wagner come first to this denomination? Why first to the Lord's people? Why first to his movement? Why first to us? The Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 1 and verse 15, I want to show you something that the Apostle Paul said. In the book of Romans chapter 1 and verse 15, the Bible says, So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Beloved, the Bible says, as much as in me is, I am what? Ready to preach. We need to remember, beloved, that readiness to preach according to the word of God is determined by the experience in the truths we profess to believe. All right? You simply can't give to the world what you yourself do not have. When we're preaching to the world, come out of Babylon, and yet our mindset is that of Babylon, we have an issue. You can't call them out of the Babylonian experience if you have not yet received for yourself the most holy experience. The most holy experience, beloved, is the fruit of this most precious message from the most holy holy place. And so God sends the message first to his people in order to fit them up that we may be ready to preach the message to others, not only as uh, sermons and as YouTube videos, certainly not, but actually as demonstrative power in the life to show people that the gospel is able to change the sinner and actually make him a saint, that there is actually substance to the things we believe and the life is the evidence of this fact. In fact, the Bible says in the book of Matthew 24, and verse 14, Jesus said, And this gospel of the kingdom should be preached as a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Before the end of all things, beloved, God needs a people who have witnessed His glory, who have beheld His character in His Son, Christ our righteousness. And by beholding, we become changed. Now, if we are changed, the things that we profess are no longer merely professions. They are the evidences of what can actually be witnessed, actually be seen in our lives. That is what God is waiting for at this time. And so he sends the message to his people first, that we may see the message, that we may receive the message, and with the message, the experience, the corresponding works the works of the righteousness of Christ, necessary to convict the world when we preach this message. Beloved, a lot of the reason as to why God does not, in fact, Sister White said that the reason why God does not yet bring many into the church is because of the, back, the backsliding condition of the members that are in it right now. The fact that we profess such lofty positions and, and high experiences in Christ, but we experience so little, is the very reason why God cannot yet call many into the church, is the very reason why the second phase of the loud cry has not yet commenced. We are still living in phase one, which is education. Power is to come, but in order for us to proclaim this message with power, beloved, the power, all right, is in the experience. It's not in the profession, but the experience. Point number four, the message came through elders Wagner and Jones. And I believe that through this series, we have spent quite a bit of time highlighting who these men were, the significance of what they had to say, as well as the origin from where that message came, right? Beloved, I would suggest that we spend time looking into who these men were for ourselves, reading the writings of these men for ourselves, hearing what inspiration the testimony of Jesus has to say about these men for ourselves. The reason why I suggest this is because in this final generation, Okay, In this final generation, Satan is seeking to deter us, to distract us from that most precious message so that he can take away from us the most holy experience. He wants to deter us only until the mediation of Christ. 
in the most holy place comes to an end. And in order to do that, he is, he is, he's, uh, he is uplifting the faults of these men. He is uplifting the faults of these men. Some say we shouldn't listen to what Jones and Wagner had to say because they made such and such mistake long after the message was presented. Beloved, when we look in the word of God, we see that often good men, men that God uh, endorses, make mistakes. All right. David was a man, the Bible says, after God's own heart. Was he a man after God's own heart when he slept with Bathsheba? And killed off her husband? No, beloved, that was sin. That was clearly sin. But the man of God repented and found favor with the Lord again. Amen? When Moses, the, the meekest man upon the earth, uh, struck the rock, rather than speaking to it, which was the instruction of God, was that all right? No, beloved, that too was sin. But he repented and he found favor again in the Lord. Praise the Lord. Beloved, the point that I'm trying to make here is that we should deal with the message upon the merits of the message and the message alone. All right. Don't block the view of the message because of the men. Don't do that, beloved. Sister White has a quotation where she literally says, what if these men fall away? What if these men should fall away? What if they should make a mistake? What if they should apostatize? She said that that would not change the fact that the message these men bore was of God. Beloved, the message is still here today. I would, I, I would encourage you, and I am encouraging you, make no, uh, make no man, let no man, discourage you from gathering the fragments of that message. Beloved, we need it at this time. With that message comes an experience. It's more than simply uh, preaching and sermonizing, beloved. It is an experience in that message, a communion with the man, Christ Jesus, in the most holy place. That is what we need at this time. Not more sermonizing. Mm -mm. Not more sermonizing. The gospel is going to be preached as a witness. And in order for it to be witnessed in you, as the apostle said in Romans chapter 1 and verse 15, that message has to enter into your experience. Beloved, go and dig up these things for yourself. She says, this message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Point number one. Who is the uplifted Savior? We know that to be Christ upon his cross. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2, the Apostle Paul says, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. The Apostle Paul says that of everything I know, of everything I am able to present before you, I have determined to know nothing except Jesus Christ, and him crucified. The prominent position of the message of the apostles was given to Jesus Christ, beloved. And inspiration says that the message came to us to bring the uplifted Savior into our message more prominently. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Does it say the sacrifice for the sins of the saints? No, beloved. Does it say the sacrifice for the sins of the believers or the Adventists? It does not say that. It says the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. How many men does that include? That includes every man. Beloved, our view of Calvary has to come up much, much higher. Inspiration says that it was to bring Christ more prominently into our message, the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole whole world. It is a message, beloved, that goes to the entire world because the entire world is involved in the message. It is a message that touches every man, thus every man ought to hear it. Beloved, if the gospel only touches the believer, then only the believer needs to hear it. But if the gospel is for every man, nation, kindred, uh, tribe, and people, then the message of the gospel must touch every, every nation, every kindred, every tribe, and every people. And this is precisely what inspiration is saying. Something was done for every man at that cross. Something was done in Christ for every man at that cross. Whether you believe it or not, it does not change the fact that something was done in Christ for you. Now, beloved, the message of Jones and Wagner highlights these points and actually brings to the forefront that which was done so that we can understand it. Again, this is not an exhaustive study, so I'm not going to give you all of the answers. I pray that you make use of the resources, right? And the Lord will lead you into all truth, just as he promised. 
In the book Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 92 and paragraph 1, we are told, The uplifted Savior is to appear in his efficacious work as the Lamb slain sitting upon the throne. Beloved, that word efficacious means successful in producing a desired or intended result. Dare I say an expected end? It means effective or fruitful. Beloved, Christ is the first fruits. Christ is the expected end of the experience we may have in the gospel that he has given us. Now, the question is, what was God's intended or desired result in the giving of the gift of Jesus Christ? During our last study, we saw in Psalms chapter 23 and verse 3 that he has been leading us in the path of righteousness. Why? For his name's sake. For the sake of his name, beloved, God leads us in the path of righteousness. And we know that his name, according to Exodus chapter 33 and 34, his name is synonymous with his glory. His glory is synonymous with his character. And so the character of God, the name of God, the glory of God, the vindication thereof, beloved, has always been the desired intent or result that God has been seeking in the giving of his son. During our last study, we saw that success in any line demands a definite aim. If the work of Christ was efficacious, was effective, was fruitful, was successful, it means that God had an aim that had been met in the sacrifice of his son. Now, before we, before we talk about that, let's finish this quotation here. It says, the uplifted Savior is to appear in his efficacious work, his effective work, his fruitful work, beloved, successful, his successful work as the lamb slain, sitting upon the throne. For what purpose? To dispense the priceless, what are these two words? Covenant blessings. Why is Christ upon the throne? To dispense the priceless covenant blessings. The benefits he had died to purchase. Why did Christ die, beloved? So that he may purchase the priceless covenant blessings and dispense those rich gifts to humanity. Amen? She says to dispense the priceless covenant blessings, the benefits he died to purchase for every soul who should believe on him. Going back now to that point I made just a second ago, a moment ago, uh, Christ's sacrifice on that cross touched the entire world. It was effective for every man in the entire world, beloved. But we see here now that the covenant blessings are received only by the souls that believe on him. You see, the heart, beloved, must respond. Inspiration confirms that every man has been affected one way or another by the sacrifice of Christ in that every loaf of bread is stamped with his cross. Beloved, every man, whether you are a saint or a sinner, will receive the resurrection. Now, there are some that come up in the first resurrection, praise the Lord, and there are those who unfortunately come up in the second resurrection. But every man will come up in the resurrection because of what was done by Christ upon that cross for them. So again, I say, the cross of Christ touches every man, sinner or saint, believer, non-believer, atheist or Seventh-day Adventist. It touches every man. And because it touches every man, beloved, every man, nation, kindred, tribe, and people ought to hear this message. Yet we're seeing here, beloved, as well, this is a very important point, that while the message of the cross does touch every man, while the message of the cross does have something for every man, while Christ upon that cross has successfully and effectively and efficaciously, praise the Lord, effected something for every man, it is the believer and the believer alone who receives the blessings of the covenant. Beloved, God needs the heart response of the faith of Christ. God needs the heart response response of the faith of Christ in order to impart unto us, to dispense unto us the promise of the covenant, the blessings of the covenant. Beloved, we, we, we need to understand the difference here. There are things about the cross that affect every man, right? Simply by the fact that, the, the fact that Christ was the representative man. 
There are things that happened in Adam that touch every man. There are men today, beloved, who are atheists and evolutionists who don't believe in the creation story at all. Or rather, let me say the creation account. It's a matter of historic fact. Praise the Lord. Biblical historic fact. There are men who do not receive or believe that account. It does not change the fact that they are here. It does not change the fact that they have inherited sinful nature because of the first man. It does not change the fact, beloved, that they were under condemnation because of the first man in the same way. Now, I'm going ahead of myself because I'm already talking to you about the two Adams, beloved, which was not my, my intention for this specific study. Uh, but in the same way, in Christ, in the last Adam, because there's no Adam to come after that, all right? This is the second chance. It is the only chance. In Christ, our righteousness, the second Adam, Every man has been touched by what he has done. But it is only those who have the response, the heart response of the faith of Christ who can receive the covenant blessings. She says to dispense the priceless covenant blessings, the benefits Christ had died to purchase for every soul who should believe. That means it's not for you if you choose to remain in unbelief. Now, God gives us the message of the gospel uh, in order to persuade. You remember that word? The Apostle Paul said, I am persuaded. The gospel is not a thing of force, beloved. We're not, we're not bashing people over the head and trying to make them believe in this man or to make them receive this man. No, 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 no. We present the matchless charms of Jesus Christ which in and of itself is potent enough to draw every man, whether you believe or not, you will be drawn, all right? But it is up to the man himself to respond in faith to the persuasive movings of the Holy Spirit. Beloved, when we are persuaded, we shall say, even as the Apostle Paul said, that there is nothing, I don't care if it's demons, I don't care if it's angels, I don't care if it's uh, in heaven, I don't care if it's on earth, there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. And the evidence of that fact is what was done for every man upon the cross in Christ Jesus by our loving Heavenly Father. Beloved, surely the Father himself loveth you. Surely, beloved, nothing shall separate you from the love of that God. Now, there's a difference between being separated from the love of God and being separated from the presence of God. You see, at the end of this great controversy, there are those of us who have failed to receive the covenant blessings because we have failed to believe on Him. We have failed to receive the covenant blessings because we have failed to appreciate the benefits of His presence. And beloved, God is going to allow every man to receive that which he chooses at the end of this, uh, this controversy. If you choose to abide in his presence, if you choose to abide in Christ, then the presence of Christ is where you will abide for all eternity. But if we, if we prefer foolishly, the uh, inspiration calls it a, a strange infatuation. It's something that literally can't be explained. It does not make sense. When you understand the man, the response of sin simply doesn't make sense. If we choose to be separated from Christ, God is not going to force us into the kingdom. Rather, he is going to allow us to experience the separation that we covet. And because we know, according to Acts chapter 17 and verse 20, 28, that in Christ we live and we move and we have our being, it then follows that separation from Christ, all right, can only result in the opposite of those things. A man who refuses the presence of Christ, a man who refuses to believe on Christ our righteousness, a man who refuses to accept the covenant blessings that he has died to purchase for that soul, cannot live, cannot move, cannot have any being because he chooses not to abide in Christ, in whom those things alone are possible. Does it make sense? The message of the gospel of his grace was to be given to the church in clear, and distinct lines that the world should no longer say that Seventh-day Adventists talk the law, the law, but do not teach or believe Christ. Beloved, for a very long time, up until that message, the world, and even today, actually, the world believed that Seventh-day Adventists are a bunch of legalistic minds. People that are more concerned with do's and don'ts than with the grace of God. But the message of the gospel of his grace, as it came through Jones and Wagner, beloved, placed Christ in his appropriate relation to the law in such a way that the law became honorable, 
Rather than being done away with, because we know that's not the case, it was uplifted and it was made honorable because the man Christ Jesus was given his prominent position where he belongs at the very heart of the law. He was seen as the life of every doctrine that God has given to this church. Beloved, this message is most precious indeed. This message is most precious indeed, and the desired effect of the Lord in giving it to Seventh-day Adventists is that that uh, worldview, that apostate Protestant worldview of this church would change entirely. You can't call a man a legalist who is entirely focused on Christ. You can't call a man a legalist who entirely desires the righteousness of Christ. Beloved, if it's the righteousness of Christ that we want, if it is the righteousness of God that we acknowledge, then we're not going about seeking to establish our own righteousness, as the Bible says, but we would receive the righteousness of Christ. Beloved, this message does so much for God's final movement if we allow it to do what he has called it to do for us in this generation. Continuing. In The Desire of Ages, page 57, paragraph 1 and 2, we're going to deal now with the fact that Christ's work upon the cross as the Lamb was efficacious, was effective, was successful to the intent or the desire that God sent it for. It accomplished the result. What was the aim of God again? He leads us in the path of righteousness for His name's sake. Was the character of God, was the name of God, was the glory of God vindicated upon Calvary's cross? We're told. In the light of the Savior's life, the hearts of all, even from the Creator to the Prince of Darkness, are what? Revealed. The gift of Christ reveals the Father's heart. At the cross of Calvary, where, beloved? At the cross of Calvary, love and selfishness stood face to face. Here, where is here? At the cross of Calvary. Here was their crowning manifestation. Beloved, those words, crowning manifestation, suggest that there is nowhere in history or in history to come where the, 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 the distinction between the character of God and the selfish character of Satan can be so clearly seen. It is at the cross of Calvary that every heart from the Creator down to the arch rebel himself is revealed. And beloved, if the character of God is revealed at the cross, then it stands that the character of God was vindicated in Christ Jesus. And it has to be so, if you really consider it, it has to be so, beloved, because if Christ did not vindicate the Father's uh, character in His earthly ministry, then where would we have to look during our ministry at this time in this final generation to, to, to behold that character and to be changed that we too may vindicate the same, that we too rather may demonstrate the same. The only place that we have to look, the only vantage point that we have is the cross of Calvary. Continuing. In the Desire of Ages, page 58 in paragraph one, we are told, in the day of final judgment, Every lost soul will understand the nature of his own rejection of the truth. The cross will be what? Presented. Beloved, hold there. Beloved, we were told that the message of Jones and Wagner came to God's church, came to God's movement, that the uplifted Savior would be more prominently presented in our message. Now we're being told that in the day of final judgment, that is, in the executive judgment of the wicked, the Father is going to present what? The cross. How does God end the great controversy? With the presentation of what? The cross. Beloved, can we see? that God has been preparing us through this message all along for the finishing of this work, for the vindication of his character before both saint and sinner, before uh, this world and before the worlds that are watching on. Beloved, we need this message of the cross of Christ's righteousness. If the Father finds this message so significant that he closes the great controversy, he closes the judgment with the presentation of that very message, who are we? to ignore the opportunity, beloved, to understand the message even now for ourselves. I keep pointing down and looking down uh, by faith because I know that in the link in the description, the cross is presented. The message is there, beloved. The very message that God intends to close the great controversy with is a click away from you. Beloved, why should we wait to be in the second resurrection to have the Father present what He's trying to present to us now as faithful Seventh-day Adventists, this side of the National Sunday Law? Beloved, take advantage of these opportunities. 
continuing, the cross will be presented and its real bearing will be seen by every mind that has been blinded by transgressions. Before the vision of Calvary, with its mysterious victim, sinners will stand condemned. Every question, how many questions? Every question of truth and error in the long-standing controversy will have been made plain. How does God do it, beloved? By the presentation of the cross of Calvary, by the presentation of the uplifted Savior, by the presentation of Christ our righteousness, beloved, our faithful high priest, for every man that will receive him, that will believe upon him. That is how every question is going to be answered, whether it's truth or error. God is going to answer every question in this long-standing great controversy with the presentation of the message he sent through Jones and Wagner. Beloved, are we understanding this thing? Are we really understanding what we are reading here? She says, the cross will be presented and its real bearing will be seen by every mind that has been blinded by transgression. Before the vision of Calvary with its mysterious victim, sinners will stand condemned. Every question of truth and error in the long-standing controversy will then have been made plain. In the judgment of the universe, God will stand clear of blame, or in other words, vindicated for the existence or continuance of evil. Beloved, God will stand clear of blame by the presentation of the cross. It is at the cross, beloved, that every heart from the Creator to the arch rebel Satan himself has been revealed. It is at the cross, beloved, that Christ vindicated the character of his Father. And if we would stand on the Mount Zion with that lamb, with the 144,000 having that character written in our foreheads, beloved, as it says in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 1, we are going to need a higher understanding, a deeper insight, a wider scope of vision, a higher experience, beloved. We're going to need to come to higher ground when it comes to the message of justification by faith, the message of Christ and his righteousness, the uplifted Savior. It presented justification through faith in the surety. It invited the people to do what? To receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Point number one, that word surety is a person who takes responsibility for another's performance of an undertaking. Beloved, has Christ taken responsibility for your performance? In this day of atonement? Yes, he has. He is Christ our righteousness. We're not seeking to establish our own righteousness, but to receive he who was made unto us righteousness. Does it make sense? Uh, the word surety means a person who takes responsibility for another's performance of an undertaking. For example, they're appearing in court for the payment of a debt. Beloved, we are living in the time of judgment. We're living in the hour of his judgment. And so Christ is our surety. The word surety also means guarantee. It means pledge. It means assurance. We sing the song, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Beloved, is Christ your surety? Yes, he is. By the grace of God, that is exactly what he was made. It is precisely what he became. Now, we want to understand, what is it about Christ that gives us assurance to stand in this day of atonement? What is it about Christ that gives us assurance to stand in the, in the presence of a holy God, even without a mediator, in this day of atonement? We're going to go in our Bibles to the book of Ezekiel chapter 18. But before we go there, I want to share with you uh, on that, that, uh, that point right there that says that the word surety means pledge. It means guarantee. Beloved, Christ is the guarantee of the Father to accomplish in you what the law says ought to be true concerning you. The law says thou shalt not steal. You may be a thief, beloved, but Christ is the assurance of God, the guarantee of God that his spirit working in you will accomplish both to will and to do of his good pleasure. 
Christ is the guarantee, beloved, that God can make what the law says a reality concerning you. He is Christ our righteousness, not merely because he did it and full stop, but because he did it and he will do it again in you by the faith of Jesus. Amen. Now we read in the book, The Desire of Ages, page 25 and paragraph 3. By his life and his death, Christ has achieved even more than recovery from the ruin wrought through sin. It was Satan's purpose to bring about an eternal separation between God and man. But in Christ, where beloved? In Christ, we become more closely united to God than if we had never fallen. Beloved, this is a most precious Thought. Follow on. It says, in taking our nature, the Savior has bound himself to humanity by a tie that is never to be broken. Through the eternal ages, he is linked with us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. She says he gave him not only to bear our sins and to die as our sacrifice. No, no, no. He gave him to the fallen race, to assure, what is that word? To assure, beloved Christ is our surety, to assure us of his immutable counsel of peace, God gave his only begotten son to become one of the human family forever to retain his human nature. Wow, beloved. Beloved, these are most precious thoughts that come from the most precious message, which came from the most holy place from Christ our high priest. Beloved, what a thought. Let's continue. It says, this is the pledge. It is what? The pledge that God will fulfill his word. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. God has adopted. Beloved, I love this truth. I love this truth. She says, God has adopted human nature in the person of his son and has carried the same into the highest heaven. It is the son of man who shares the throne of the universe. It is the Son of Man, whose name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The I Am is the daysman between God and humanity, laying his hand upon both. He who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, is not ashamed to call us his brethren. In Christ. Where, beloved? In Christ. Now, pause there. The reason why I emphasize these two words, beloved, in Christ. The moment you begin studying this message, those two words become everything to you. Beloved, everything we have, Everything we are, everything we aspire to be in righteousness is obtained in the man, Christ Jesus. Nowhere else, beloved. No, no, no. It is in Christ. It is not separate from him. The Bible said in Acts 17, 28, let's say it again. In him, we live and we move and we have our being. That word being means existence. It is in Christ. All right? So anything outside of Christ simply cannot exist. It can simply have no being. It can't have any substance, any life. Beloved, it's simply imaginary. If we want it, we must have it where? In Christ. If we want to experience it, we must experience it where? In Christ. If it is true, then it is true where? In the man Christ Jesus. Beloved, these are most precious thoughts. She says, in Christ, the family of earth and the family of heaven are bound together. Christ glorified is our brother. Heaven is enshrined in humanity, and humanity is enfolded in the bosom of infinite love. Beloved, what a mighty God we serve. What a wonderful gospel is this. Beloved, as we, as we read these points that we have, can we not see that we owe it to every man under the sun to share this message? 
We, and not only to share this message, beloved, because I'm telling you, preaching is not enough. We owe it to every man under this sun in understanding this thing to actually partake in the experience so that they may witness it and they may behold and become changed as well. Beloved, God has placed upon our shoulders nothing that he has not already placed upon the shoulder of Christ. We read here, beloved, that the, 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 the government shall be upon his shoulder. Beloved, it is upon the shoulders of Jesus. And in Christ, it is upon our shoulders. But because he has walked this path before us, we may follow. And I add, beloved, we may follow him successfully. That is what the Bible meant when it said that Christ did no sin and has left us an example that we may follow his steps. Beloved, we are not dealing with impossibilities. We're looking at a Savior who became us in all points. We're looking at a Savior who understands us in all points and has a victory for us. Beloved, I am going to emphasize this thing until Jesus comes. In fact, it is the emphasizing of this thing that ushers in his coming. What do you say? In the book of Ezekiel, let's go in the book of Ezekiel. Let's go in our Bibles. We're going to the book of Ezekiel now, chapter 18 and verse 20, dealing with the fact that Christ is our surety. I want to show you that that word surety presented in the 1888 message uh, paints Christ in a light that is greater than merely a substitute. What do I mean by that? Christ in the 1888 message, beloved, is more for us than a mere substitute. It's not merely that he took our place, end of story. No, 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 beloved. Because if he merely took our place, well, let me not give it away. Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20. Let's go there in our Bibles. The Bible says in the book of Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20, the soul that sinneth. Who? The soul that sinneth. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Who shall die, beloved? The soul that sinneth. This text is telling us that the death belongs to the soul that sinneth. The death must be paid by the responsible party. They are the one who must die. Does the text say, the soul that sinneth, a substitute shall die in their stead? No, beloved, that is not what the Bible says. That is not Bible teaching. The text does not say, the soul that sinneth, someone else will die for you. No. It says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Now, follow the thought, beloved, because if you cut the video off here, you're going to miss a gem. You're going to miss the gem that makes the most precious message what it is. Christ is more than a substitute, beloved. The text says that the soul that sinneth, it, no other party, beloved, but the soul that sinneth, the responsible party, it must die. That means that in order to die for any man, Christ must first become that man. The only way that Christ can die for any man is if Christ becomes that man because the soul that sinneth it not a substitute beloved it shall die follow the point let's go to exodus chapter 34 exodus chapter 34 and verse 6 the bible says and the lord passed by before him that is moses and proclaimed this is the character of god now now the bible says that i am the lord i do what i change not he is jesus christ the same yesterday today and how long forever. So whatever we read concerning the name or the glory or the character of God, is it changeable? No, beloved. As true as it was in the days of Moses, it was true during the day of Christ, and it is true in this final generation, we are told. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and in truth keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, pay attention, and that will by no means clear the guilty. Did you catch that? The Bible says that it is not in the character of God to clear the guilty by any means. He will by no means clear the guilty. Beloved, any understanding of the gospel that takes Christ and, and, and leaves him merely as a substitute, leaves him merely as some means that God used to clear the guilty, misses the entire picture altogether. 
That was not the picture that was painted through the 1888 message. Christ is not just a substitute. He has to be more than that, beloved, because in order to answer the death that we have to die, he would have to be the responsible party. Now, was Christ ever responsible for sin? Absolutely not. The Bible says in him was no sin. He knew no sin. But the fact is that God made him to be sin for us. Beloved, God made Christ to be sin for us. God, God did not make Christ to be a sinner. Do you see that? Christ never committed sin, but God made him to be sin itself for us. Beloved, this is a very deep thing that we're talking about here. Christ never was a sinner, right? But he took upon him our fallen nature. He was tempted in all points, such as we were, yet without sin. But God made Christ to be sin. Do you understand how deep that concept is? To be the very thing that separated us from God. He, he, he made him to be sin for us, that we could become the righteousness of God in him. That is what Christ has done. So then again, beloved, I'm telling you that the message of Jones and Wagner presents Christ in such a light that he is more than merely a substitute the soul that sinneth, it shall die, and thus to die for any man, Christ must become that man. The Bible says that Christ will by no means clear the guilty. So we can't use the cross as some means to clear the guilty. In fact, the Bible says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. But beloved, it's not just that Christ gave himself for me. We're about to see Christ gave himself as me. That's the only way that the sacrifice works. According to Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20. Beloved, that is the only way that the sacrifice works. According to Exodus chapter 34 verses 6 and 7, God will by no means clear the guilty. And so at the cross, we don't see the guilty escaping. If I'm crucified with Christ, was I guilty? Absolutely. Did I escape the death? No, I died it in Christ. But because he lives, beloved, I must live also. You see, my sinfulness, my sinful fallen nature was the ticket of Christ into the grave. But the righteousness of Christ was my ticket out and onto the throne of God where he now sits. Beloved, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is what is accomplished for every man who would have the thing, beloved. This is the truth as it is in Christ Jesus. In fact, it is the third angel's message in verity. Beloved, we need to understand these concepts even now. Let me, uh, let me add further evidence from the word of God. In the book of Hebrews chapter 2, Let's go in our Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9 says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for how many men? Every man. Jesus was made lower than the angels. Beloved, he who was equal with God, the Bible says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and that word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Beloved, Jesus was made a little lower than the angels. He came exactly to where you and I are, right? He came exactly into our experience. This same Jesus, that he would taste death for every man. Now we've already accomplished that in order to die for any man, Jesus would have to do what? Become that man. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 26 says that such an high priest became us. Christ must become the man to die the death for any man. But the Bible says that he tasted death for every man. This must mean that our faithful high priest became how many men? Every man. Beloved, in Christ, we receive the victory over all temptation. Christ was tempted in all points. He became every man, and so he was tempted in the point of every man. Whatever your temptation may be, Christ has victory for that thing for you because he became you. 
Can you see then that when we receive Christ, we are made more than conquerors through him that loved us because in him there is more than simply the victory that you need. There's the victory that the other man needs and the man after that man. But in Christ, all of it is yours. You may never have experienced the temptation that the other man experiences, beloved, but you certainly receive the victory that that other man needs. This is why we are accounted as more than conquerors through him that loved us. This is the complete victory. The efficacious, effective, successful, fruitful work of the Lamb of God. And our high priest upon that throne in the most holy place at this time, beloved, is uh, seeking to dispense the covenant blessings which he died to purchase that very same gift. She says, many had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person, to his merits and to his changeless love for the human family. Three points. His divine person, his merits, his changeless love for the human family. Beloved, if we're looking upon Christ, beloved, if we're looking upon Christ and we have yet to see uh, improved views on his divine person, on his merits, and on his changeless love for the human family, then we have yet to look upon the man correctly. We have yet to look upon the man, to study the man in all of his facets as it concerns you and I. This message shifts our focus to the consideration and to the study of Christ in three primary contexts. So write this down. Number one, his divine person, which is the divinity of Christ. Number two, his merits, which includes his ministry as both lamb and priest. And number three, his changeless love for the human family, which is in fact the love of the Father for man, the study of which vindicates his character. Uh, point number two, beloved. This message invites us to study Christ in the context of his merits, which includes his ministry as both lamb and priest, the life of Christ during his earthly ministry, as well as the ministration of Jesus in the holy and then finally in the most holy place. Beloved, what is the difference between the message of justification by faith as presented by Jones and Wagner and the message of justification by faith that was presented coming out of the dark ages through men like Martin Luther? Uh, Huss and Jerome, Wycliffe. What is the difference, beloved? The difference is the most holy ministration of Christ in that most holy apartment of the heavenly sanctuary. Beloved, as surely as the glory of God is brighter in the most holy place than it is in the holy place at this time, so the message of justification by faith as presented through Jones and Wagner is brighter, is highly improved to that which was presented through Martin Luther and the men of his day. Beloved, truth is progressive. It advances. And as we find ourselves in the hour of his judgment, the gospel of his grace is more effective, is uh, brighter, it is improved upon, it is clearly and distinctly different from that which those men had. Why is it different, beloved? It is different because we're living in a different apartment of the, of the heavenly sanctuary. We're living in the day of atonement, the most holy place work of Jesus Christ. We're not living in the holy place time as those men were. We're living in the day of atonement. And because of that truth, beloved, there is added power. There is added clarity. As a matter of fact, uh, when you look in the, the Hebrew um, depiction of the earthly sanctuary, from the outer court to the holy place, to the most holy place, it was in the most holy place that the Ark of the Covenant was found. In the Ark of the Covenant is where the law of God was found. And beloved, so understanding that law is increased as you move into the most holy place. In the same way as Christ is surely our high priest in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary as of October 22nd, 1844, as surely as that is the case, the message of Jones and Wagner is that much higher, that much brighter, that much more clear and improved upon than was the message of Luther. Beloved, it's not the same justification by faith. 
No, 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 no. It is even higher because it is placed in the context of the ministration of Christ in that most holy place. All power is given into his hands that he may dispense rich gifts unto men, imparting the priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. Beloved, who does this gift go to? It goes to the helpless human agent. And so again, I say, unless we recognize ourselves to be perfectly weak, perfectly helpless, all right, the righteousness of Christ can do nothing for us at all. The righteousness of Christ is a gift to who? The helpless human agent. And so you cannot receive it unless you are the person to whom it was addressed. Beloved, you're going to, re you're going to return this message to sender. You see that? You're going to return the message to sender unless you recognize yourself on the, uh, the, the address. It says that it is addressed to the helpless human agent. If that is not you, you are going to return it to sender. Beloved, it is not something to be ashamed of in the Day of Atonement uh, to recognize that we are helpless and that we are weak. That is the best place we can be in the Day of Atonement when we're expected to stand before a holy God without a mediator. Beloved, the Bible says, let him who thinketh he stand take heed lest he do what? Fall. If God is going to prepare a people to stand, we first must recognize that our ability to do so depends not upon our strength, not upon our method, not upon our merits or our works. Beloved, by the deeds of the law shall no man be justified. Okay? We need to lean entirely upon the method, upon the righteousness, upon the merits and the workings of our faithful high priest at this time. Now, she says it is the priceless gift of his own righteousness. It is a priceless gift. Priceless because there's nothing you can do to purchase it. A gift because there's nothing that you can do to earn it. It is given to us. As a matter of fact, we read here. In Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 115 in paragraph 1, we are told, The one thing essential for us, in order that we may, number one, receive, and number two, impart the forgiving love of God, is to know and believe the love that He has towards us. Beloved, is it your desire to receive and impart the forgiveness of God? to impart and to receive the love of God, then there's only one thing essential for you at this time, and that is to know and to believe the love that he has towards you. She says, Satan is working by every deception he can command in order that we may not discern that love. He will lead us to think that our mistakes and our transgressions have been so grievous that the Lord will not have respect unto our prayers and will not bless and save us. In ourselves, we can see nothing but weakness, nothing to recommend us to God, and Satan will tell us that it is of no use. We cannot remedy our defects of character. When we try to come to God, the enemy will whisper, it is of no use for you to pray. Did not you do that evil thing? Have you not sinned against God and violated your own conscience? But we may tell the enemy that the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all of our sin. When we feel that we have sinned and cannot pray, it is then the time to pray. Ashamed we may be and deeply humbled, but we must pray and believe. She says forgiveness, reconciliation with God does what? Comes to us. Beloved, did she say that forgiveness and reconciliation with God is something we must seek after? She didn't say that. No, no, no. She said forgiveness and reconciliation with God is something that comes to us. Beloved, she is presenting Christ to you as an initiator of that relationship. We're not forgiven, beloved, because we seek forgiveness. No, no, no. The Bible said that no man seeks after God. The gospel, as presented through Jones and Wagner, shows Christ as the initiator of that relationship. Beloved, it's not that the one sheep went back to the 99 and sought the shepherd. No, no, no. It is that the shepherd sought that one. 
The shepherd Jesus Christ has sought you and I. Forgiveness, reconciliation to God has come to us through Christ. Beloved, we have never sought this man. No, no, no. But this man has relentlessly and lovingly sought you and I. The fact that we're here talking about this message even now is evidence, beloved, that the Holy Spirit is working upon us even now. He's working upon me even now. Lord, thank you. We have to acknowledge, beloved, the way that this thing works. Because if we look at the uh, salvation of man, if we look at forgiveness and reconciliation to God as something that we are to strive and seek for, we're missing the gospel entirely. The gospel is not that man has done something to gain the favor of God. No, no, no. The gospel is that God so loved the world that he gave, beloved. He initiated. He sought. He forgave. He uplifted. He redeemed. He restored. He has sought us, beloved, in Christ our righteousness, beloved. And today you are accepted in the beloved, not because of anything you've done. All right. It's not because of anything that I've done. In fact, there's nothing that I can do successfully except to fail without my Savior. He says, without me, you can do nothing. But beloved, because of who he is, and I tell you he is a good God, you, you must taste and see for yourself. I'm only speaking from my experience with this message and my experience practically in life. Because of who he is, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. The song says, because I know he holds the future, life is worth the living because he lives. Beloved, Christ is our initiator. He has called us, beloved, and in calling us, we may go. Because all his biddings are enablings. You know, sometimes I'm talking about these things, even now, and as I'm sharing these most precious thoughts, I, 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 am, I am overwhelmed with thoughts. I, I spew them out. I just, I say one thing after another. It's, 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 it's a never ending uh, train of thought, beloved, because this message has presented Christ to me in such a way, and it will do for you the same thing. It presents Christ in such a way that he cannot be seen as anything but a complete savior. Beloved, anything that I needed salvation from or that I need salvation from even now, it's there in Christ. The same for you. Anything that you need salvation from or that you have needed salvation from, it is there in Christ for you. If there is any temptation that should beset you, God forbid, a week from now or two weeks from now or three years from now, it is in Christ that that victory has been worked out. And it is because God has sought you out through his son. The Bible says that the father was in his son reconciling the world unto himself. It's not that God needed to be reconciled to us. No, no, no. God didn't have a problem with you. You had a problem with him. And in order for you to be reconciled unto him, beloved, God had to show you who he is. The Bible says that Christ is the express image of the father's person. Beloved, as you look upon this man, do you find your father attractive? Do you see yet that the Father himself loveth you? Or are you still confused as to what it is that God thinks about you? We are told, forgiveness, reconciliation with God comes to us not as a reward for our works. It is not bestowed because of the merit of sinful men, but it is a gift unto us having in the spotless righteousness of Christ its foundation for a bestowal. Why does God give us this gift, beloved? Because Christ is so good. The gift is not given because you or I are so good, beloved, because in fact, we are entirely bad. We are so bad. Amen? But God is so good. And because he is so good, beloved, that is the foundation of his giving. He gives because he is good. He doesn't withhold because you are evil, and he doesn't give because you are good. He gives because he is good. What a mighty God we serve. What a loving father we have, beloved. These thoughts are so encouraging to me uh, because as I look at myself on a day-to-day -day basis, even this work as I was, uh, even this week rather, as I was working, uh, you know, I work as an EMT here in New York. New York is a rough place, beloved. You deal with uh, different characters and cer certain times, beloved, you have to admit to yourself that certain characters tempt you to come out of your character, right? 
And you know, th this week, the Lord has been upholding me and he has been encouraging me and he has been strengthening me. And as often as I think of him, there is strength to endure. As often as I think about Jesus, there is strength to endure. Beloved, I want you to know that there is strength, encouragement, peace, security in the consideration of this man. And so the next time you find yourself, as I often do, tested, beloved, in uh, the various affairs of life, whether it be at work or just in your home life, because we know that's a very real thing as well, or in the church or wh whatever it may be, consider this man. Consider, beloved, that you have been pursued, though you never even thought of this man. Consider, beloved, that while the, uh, the man Saul was persecuting Jesus, Jesus sought to get Paul out of Saul. Praise the Lord. Consider, beloved, that while we were in our sins, Christ died for the ungodly. Beloved, this, this message has often uh, brought me to tears. Often. Because there is nothing about me, there is nothing about man that is worthy of this, this gift. But beloved, we have the gift and we receive the gift, not because of who we are, all right? It is entirely because of how good he is. Isn't he good, beloved? Isn't he good? This is the message, she says, that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in a large measure. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. And so, beloved, if our desire is to be a part of God's final team who finished the work. It is this message that we must understand. Now we're going to begin going into a few of those thoughts that I spoke about a moment ago. A few of these most precious thoughts. Uh, some of the, uh, the, uh, the things that Jones and Wagner bring to our view that I, in my personal experience, have come to treasure so much. There are specific truths, uh, and as you read, I'm sure that there are specific things in the message that you will come to appreciate so much so because of your own experience, all right? But we're going to talk about this thing. Again, this is not an exhaustive study upon the message. If I were to do that, I fear that you would, uh, you would be discouraged from reading, all right? But I want to encourage you to read, beloved. Read for yourself. There is more to be learned in the, f in the presence of Jesus. There is more to be learned at the feet of Jesus, I humbly say, than upon a YouTube video. And I want you to spend your time reading and studying for yourself. The Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God, workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. My good friend, Brother Michael, says this often, and I will repeat it even now. You are not to believe what I say. You are not to reject what I say. Simply consider it. Take it to the word of God. Go study for yourself and let him have the final say. What do you say? Jesus said in the book of John, chapter 16, verses 7 through 11, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient. It is what? Expedient. That word expedient means convenient. It is a good thing for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter, who? The comforter will not come unto you. So Jesus says that it is convenient for you. It is good news for you that I am going away. Now, where was Jesus going when he said these words? He was going to his father in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, 31 AD. That is where he was going. And Jesus says, it is good news for you. It is convenient. It is expedient that I go to my father in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Because if I go, the comforter, that is the Holy Spirit, right, will come unto you. We need the Holy Spirit. We're told, the Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, when who is come? The Comforter, the Holy Spirit. When he is come, he will reprove the world, that is convict the world, of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Write those three things down. The work of the Holy Spirit, beloved, in our generation is to convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. He goes on to explain, 
of sin because they do what? Believe not on me. Of righteousness because who? I go to my Father and ye see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. And so we conclude from this text, beloved, that under the instruction of the Holy Spirit, we must expect improved views, deeper insight regarding sin in the context of unbelief. All right, that's number one. Righteousness in the context of Christ. All right, that's number two. Because he said of righteousness because I, the, the, the context that he was speaking of was himself. He says of righteousness because I go to my Father. So the Holy Spirit teaches us of righteousness in the context of Christ and God's judgment as well in the context of Christ's earthly ministry. These are the three things that we should be expecting improved views on when it comes to to the message that was brought by Jones and Wagner. Why? Because the message of Jones and Wagner was the beginning of the loud cry. It was the beginning of the latter rain, which is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes, these are the things he reproves us of. These are the things he convicts us of. These are the things he improves and deepens our understanding of. Our first category, righteousness, is a person. Beloved, when I was studying this message, and as I am still studying this message, uh, one of the, the, the most precious thoughts that I have come to admire is the context in which righteousness is spoken. You know, righteousness is always, to me, when I was younger, I've always considered righteousness as something to be done, something good that is done, something that is respected by God that I have done. I've always looked at it as the right doings of God's people, the right doings of some man. But the message of Jones and Wagner uh, entirely takes that concept and places it in Christ, so much so that Christ himself becomes the righteousness we seek. Righteousness is not a list of do's and don'ts, beloved. In fact, the Bible says in the book of Psalm chapter 119 and verse 172, My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. And so again, when we're talking about righteousness, our, our first thought is normally the commandments of God. If God's commandments are righteousness, we conclude that righteousness, therefore, must be the doing of God's commandments. Now, there's no argument with that in the, argue, uh, in the message of Jones and Wagner. There's no argument there. Uh, the question is not whether or not the law ought to be kept. The question is how, all right? The question is how the law ought to be kept. The question is who does the keeping? Who does the keeping of God's law? Is it man or is it God working in man both to will and to do? of his good pleasure. I think I've already given you the answer. In the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 22 through 25, the Bible says, speaking of the Jews, and the Lord showed signs and wonders great and sore upon Egypt, upon Pharaoh, and upon all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from thence that he might bring us in to give us the land which he sware unto our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. And it shall be what? Our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments. Now Israel had an understanding of God's law that told them that their righteousness was their doing of his law. Beloved, is that correct? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the answer now. That is, that is not a correct view. Uh, surely, righteousness is the doing of God's commandments, okay? The issue is not whether or not the commandments should be done. The issue is not whether or not the commandments should be kept. The issue is how are they kept? Who does the doing? And again, I say the message of Jones and Wagner teaches Christ in such a context that we see Christ as righteousness itself. All right. Our righteousness is Christ. Our righteousness is not the doing of the law in our own strength. That's impossible. All our righteousness. That means all of our right doing is filthiness and is as filthy rags, the Bible says. The Bible says in Romans chapter 7 and verse 12, Wherefore, the law is what? Holy, and the commandment is holy and just and good. Beloved, the message of Jones and Wagner 
helps us to see that only a holy people can keep a holy law. If the law is holy and the law is good and the law is just, then only a holy, good, and just people can keep that law. How do you, a sinner, keep holy a Sabbath, beloved, that is already holy? How do you keep it holy if you yourself are not holy? I want you to begin thinking about these things. And I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not irreverently challenging you, all right? I am challenging you as a brother because I want your mind to begin thinking. If the law of God is holy, if the standard is high and holy, then the people that keep it, is the law holy? Yes. So the people that keep it holy themselves must be holy. But if we're sinners already, beloved, then that is impossible. It then follows, according to the message of Jones and Wagner, that in order to keep a holy law, the sinner must first be made holy. God must do something first before the sinner can keep holy a holy law because we are unholy altogether. Do you see that? Let's follow on in the Word of God. The Bible says... In the book of Romans, chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, as it is written, there is how many? None righteous. No, not one. There is none, beloved, that understandeth. There is none, beloved, that seeketh after God. They are how many? All gone out of the way. They are together, that is all of us, become what? Unprofitable. That word unprofitable means ineffective. I'm going to make up a word here, inefficacious, all right? Because we saw that the sacrifice of Christ was efficacious. It was effective. It was fruitful. It was uh, successful. But the effort of man altogether is unprofitable. I say inefficacious, ineffective, unsuccessful, and unfruitful to the fruit of righteousness. Beloved, we can't do it in our own strength, all right? We need the righteousness of Christ. Christ is our righteousness. Now, A.T. Jones adds a very important thought from the General Conference Daily Bulletin, 1893 Sermons on the Third Angel's Message. Speaking of the Sabbath, which we know to be holy, all right, because God rested on the Sabbath and he made it holy. A.T. Jones says, Now, another thing. Who was the real present agent in creating? They said Christ. Who was it that rested that first Sabbath? They said Christ. Who was refreshed? They said Christ. Who blessed? They said Christ. Whose presence, catch this beloved, whose presence made it holy? Christ's. Whose presence is in the day? That is the Sabbath. Christ. Then the man whom the presence of Jesus, now catch this, beloved, he says, the man whom the presence of Jesus does not sanctify and does not make holy and does not bless and to whom it does not bring rest, why he cannot keep the Sabbath. Don't you see that it is only with Christ in the man that the Sabbath can be kept? Because the Sabbath brings and has in it the presence of Christ. Beloved, again, I say that it is Christ alone who is holy that can keep that law. We are not holy, and so for unholy beings to keep a holy day, we need to first be made holy, and our holiness is found only in communion with Jesus. It is in Christ that we live, that we move, and that we have our righteous being, beloved. It is in him alone. Amen? So Jones is saying here that the seventh day Sabbath, which we know to be uh, holy, can't be kept by an unholy man. No, no, no. That man must first receive the presence of Christ, which made the day holy, and the presence of Christ, which made the day holy, will make the man holy, and a holy man, by the grace of God, can keep a holy day. What are you saying? Praise God. In the book of Romans chapter 3, verses 20 through 22, the Bible says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Beloved, the law can do nothing but give you the knowledge of sin. You see, the law of God shows you what is right. And in showing you what is right, it shows you that you are all wrong. Now, in your wrongness, beloved, the law isn't changed. 
It condemns you in your wrongness, but in your wrongness, can you now proceed to be right? Can you now proceed in your own strength to be righteous? Absolutely not. The law gives you the knowledge of sin and it condemns you in that knowledge. But at the same time, beloved, the law is designed to show you your need of someone who is altogether righteous, someone who is your savior, someone who can help you. That someone is Christ, our righteousness. But now the righteousness of God, the what? The righteousness of God. It's speaking of Christ, beloved. It calls Christ the righteousness of God. It says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. Beloved, here in Romans chapter 3, verses 20 through 22, the Bible refers to Christ as the righteousness of God. Christ is the righteousness of God. All right? He is the character of God. He is the, uh, uh, the express image of the Father's person. He is the outshining of His glory. Right? He is the representative of His name. Christ is the Father's thoughts made audible. He is the righteousness of God. Now, that's very important for us to mark. I want you to mark that first. The message of Jones and Wagner uh, identifies Christ as the righteousness of God. Point number one. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 30 through 31, the Bible says, But of Him, that is the Father, but of Him are you where? In Christ Jesus. Jesus. Where are we, beloved? In Christ Jesus. How did we get there? The Father placed us there. But of Him are you in Christ Jesus. Beloved, is it true? Is it true? The Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. Beloved, where are you today? Spiritually speaking, where are you today? You are in Christ that is where the Father placed you. But where is Christ today, beloved? Christ is in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And where are you at this time? Right there in Him. Because that is precisely where the Father placed you. This is why Daniel 8.14 is so significant to every soul at this time. Because every soul, every man that Christ tasted death for, has been placed by the Father in Christ. We have been placed by the Father in Christ. We're going to come back to that point because the message of Jones and Wagner highlights these words in Christ over and over again. I want us to understand the significance of those two words before the end of this message. The Bible says, but of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God, that is of the Father, is made unto us. Those words, made unto us, imply that he was not thus before. He became something that he was not before. What was he before? The Bible said in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Beloved, Christ was and is God. But in this context, we're seeing that God made him something else. Christ became something that he was not so that we in him might become what we were not. Beloved, are you catching this thing? Christ became that which he was not, that you and I in him would become something that we never were. Beloved, I'm so thankful for the grace of God. You know, today someone may ask, you know, uh, you believe in victory over sin, Brother Paul. Are you perfect? Do you have victory today? Beloved, the question is not whether or not I am perfect. The, 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 the subject is that Christ is perfect. Christ is my righteousness. It is in Him that I am. I receive that by His faith and by His grace. That is becoming a reality of me every single moment of every single day. There are things that I must overcome even now. Still, the Lord is still bringing things to my attention as I am sure He is doing the same with you. But beloved, as we hold to that truth, that that is where we are in Him, the realities of being in Him become the realities of our daily experience. So don't ask me if I'm perfect, all right? I will point you simply to the man Christ Jesus. And as you look at that man, I will show you you in that man too, so that your perfection is swallowed up by his perfection. Or rather, your imperfection is swallowed up by the perfection of Christ. 
Christ is the subject, beloved. And so whenever uh, people uh, question us concerning victory over sin and try to make us the subject of the matter, beloved, which isn't the subject at all, point them to the man. Point them to the man because the man and the reception of the man is the plan. If we look upon Christ by beholding him, the very question you're asking me, the affirmative will become true. Amen? By looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith, everything that is true about that man becomes true about me. Now, mind you, if there's anything we learn from the, uh, the story of Job, it is that man in and of himself will never reach a point where he can say, I am perfect where he can say, I am sinless. Beloved, that is not our job. We saw in studies past that God, does, God is not in the business of defending himself, all right? He sends Christ, Christ vindicates him. Christ is not in the business of defending himself. He sends us, we vindicate him. We are not in the business, by the grace of God, of defending ourselves. It is not for us, it is not our work to declare ourselves sinless or perfect. We declare the sinlessness of Christ, amen? And when he who is faithful, is come. He will declare over his people. Beloved, read in the chapter in Great Controversy, the chapter God's people delivered, and you will see exactly what I'm talking about. Jesus himself will vindicate his law. Jesus himself will vindicate his people. When the entire world is against you, your Savior stands for you. And so when you read in that chapter, you're going to see that uh, though we never claim perfection in and of ourselves, in fact, all the way up to the coming of Christ, Sister White says that when we see him, our question is, uh, uh, are, are, are we right? Are we, are we ready? And his response is, my grace is sufficient for you. Beloved, leave the declaring of your righteousness to Christ, our righteousness. Leave that with him. Leave the salvation of your soul in the hands of the faithful high priest. Take up the vindication of his character, all right? Make that your thrust. Make that your effort. Make that your aim. Forget about your salvation. Forget about it, beloved. Leave it entirely in the hands of Jesus. Take up the vindication of his character. And the promise is that he who began a work will be faithful to finish it in you. He will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Beloved, do you trust him? We need to trust Jesus. But of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness. Christ was made unto us wisdom and righteousness. So beloved, when we're talking about the righteousness of God, when we're talking about the righteousness of God being Christ, and now we're seeing that the righteousness of man, the righteousness of you and I is who? Jesus Christ. Can you see that the righteousness of God and the righteousness of man are synonymous. God has worked out in the plan of salvation in such a way in his son that it is impossible to discuss the righteousness of God without discussing the righteousness of man because they are both Christ. Christ is the righteousness of God. Christ is the righteousness of man. And thus Christ, beloved, is the only righteousness there is in the universe. Did you catch that point? There is no other righteousness to be sought. If you're looking for it, then you will only find it in Him. He is the source. He is the righteousness itself, beloved. It is so for God. God's righteousness is Christ. God's righteousness is Christ. He reveals Himself through Christ. Amen? If you ask the Father who He was, He would point you to Jesus. If you ask the man who He is, He will point you to Jesus. Jesus is all in all. He is the only righteousness in the universe. And so again I say, the message of Jones and Wagner presents Christ in such a way uh, that you see righteousness to be a person, not merely a list of do's and don'ts for sinners that cannot. No, no, no. Christ is the only righteousness in the entire universe. Adding to this point, in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, the Bible says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we, that who, beloved? We, that is you and I, we might be made, those words again, we might be made. It means it's not true of us before, but God has done something that will make it possible, that has made it possible in Christ. We might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. Beloved, oh my Lord. The Father's plan is that in Christ, you and I are made 
His righteousness. When we're asking what God looks like, His desire is that He may point to Christ, and in Christ, you and I may be found living epistles, actual witnesses, evidence of who He is. Beloved, this is what it means to vindicate the character of God. And it is only possible where? In Christ. Where are we made the righteousness of God? In Christ. Where are we made the character of God? In Christ. Where can we vindicate Him? In Christ. So then the 144,000 who stand on the Mount Zion with the Lamb, having the Father's name written in their forehead, where are they experientially, beloved? They are in Christ. Beloved, the significance of this message, I pray, I pray it does not go over your head. I pray that we're catching these points. So we saw already that Christ is the righteousness of God. Christ is our righteousness. And in Christ, where the Father has placed us, amen, we are the righteousness of God. We are a reference letter to who He is as we abide in His Son. Again, Acts chapter 17 and verse 28, the Bible says, For in Him, where? In Christ. In Him we live and we move and we have our being. The only place that life and movement and existence is possible is in the man Christ Jesus. Now this is significant when you tie it in with what's said here in Colossians chapter 1 verses 19 and 20. The Bible says, speaking of the Father, for it pleased the Father that in Him, where? In Christ, beloved, should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of His cross, by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself, by Him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things where? In heaven. Beloved, are we aware that the cross of Christ is just as much for the angels in heaven as it was for sinful man? Now somebody says, what, 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 could, what benefit could the cross have to sinless angels? What do you mean by that? Had the angels sinned? No, beloved. No, no, no. They were faithful to God during the war. They overcame him, though, the Bible says, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. When you read in the book uh, Desire of Ages, Sister White tells you, she lets you know, that that uh, text particularly is in reference to what was done by Christ upon the cross. When Christ died upon the cross, there was something accomplished. The Bible says that there was a reconciliation accomplished unto himself for the things in heaven. Heaven was affected by that sacrifice, beloved. And so again, I tell you, if the Father intends to end the controversy and answer every question by the presentation of the cross, all right? If the Father intends to finish the work in this generation by the uplifting of the Savior, the presentation of the cross. If the presentation of Jesus upon the cross affected the reconciliation of heavenly beings, how much more do you and I, erring mortals, need the presentation of that cross to be understood? Beloved, take advantage of what is here below. Go and look to the message for yourself. Go and understand it. Dig and excavate. The time is now. By him to reconcile all things unto himself, by Christ I say, whether they be things in earth, which is you and I, or things in heaven, which are the sinless heavenly beings. Now, beloved, where do these sinless heavenly beings have their reconciliation unto God? In Christ. It is in Christ that those sinless beings live. Amen? It is in Christ that those sinless angels move. Amen? It is in Christ that those sinless angels, right, have any being, and we know that they are righteous, they live righteous lives in Christ, but it is all in Christ. Beloved, Christ, therefore, is the, is the righteousness of angels. He is the righteousness of sinless beings in heaven. He is the righteousness of man, and he is the righteousness of God. Again, I say, Christ is the only righteousness in the universe. If you ask Gabriel what righteousness was, he would point you to the man Christ Jesus. If you ask the Father what righteousness was, he would say, the righteousness of God is my Son, Jesus Christ. If you ask man today who understand this message what righteousness is, we don't point you to a list of do's and don'ts. We point you to the person, the man Christ Jesus. Our faithful high priest, beloved, is our righteousness. He is the only righteousness in the universe, and there is a window of opportunity now 
while his ministration in the heavenly sanctuary continues, where we can receive that man. We can receive the marriage in Christ. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 7 and verse 8, giving us some insight now on the judgment, now that we know what righteousness is, it says, The Lord shall judge the people. Judge me, O Lord, according to what? My righteousness and according to mine integrity that is in me. God judges us according to our righteousness. Beloved, God judges man according to his righteousness. Now, if righteousness was a list of do's and don'ts, if righteousness was simply the good works of a man himself, and we know that our righteousness are all as filthy rags, if God judged us according to that, would there be any hope for us in the judgment today? Absolutely not. But when we have the understanding that came through the message of Jones and Wagner, when we understand that Christ is righteousness, that Christ even more so is our righteousness, then when we read this text that says that God will judge us according to our righteousness, then we're reading that God will judge men according to Christ. Beloved, do you see it? It changes our understanding of the Day of Atonement, of the, of the investigative judgment. What exactly is God looking for? You see, all throughout the Word of God, you will not find the word investigative. You'll hear about the judgment everywhere, but you will not read the word investigative. We got that from inspiration. But the word investigative implies a looking into, a, a, a searching for, for discovery. That's what investigating means, right? Now, question, how much does God know? The Bible shows us that God is omniscient. God knows all Things. There is nothing that he doesn't know. His, his, his knowledge is perfect. His, his understanding is unsearchable. God knows all things. Does God know you? Does he know me? Absolutely. Why does he need to investigate us? Beloved, the question is not whether or not he's investigating you and I. He knows us. The question is, what is being investigated? The Bible says here, the Lord shall judge the people according to their righteousness, and Christ is our righteousness. So if the Lord is judging us according to Christ, it must be concluded that God is judging us in according to our relation to the man Christ Jesus. The question of the judgment, beloved, is not whether or not we have done good works. No, no, no. Because if we are in Christ, then good works will follow. That's the fruit, all right? God is going to the root in the judgment. The question is, have we chosen to abide? In Christ. A man that abides in Christ will produce fruit. As a matter of fact, the next text right here, it says in the book of John chapter 15 verses 1 through 6, we see a very accurate picture of the judgment. Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me, every branch where? In me that beareth not Fruit. Beloved, catch that point. He says, every branch in me that beareth not fruit. Beloved, are there branches in Christ that bear not fruit? Yes, there are. Jesus just said that. Jesus says, not every man that is in me will bear fruit. The entire world, beloved, has been placed in Christ by the Father. The atheist has been placed there. The Satanist has been placed there. The Muslim man has been placed there. The Roman Catholic has been placed there. But not every man in Christ bears fruit. Why is that, beloved? Because not every man that was placed there chooses to abide there. Is it possible to be in Christ and not bear fruit? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Because initially, that is precisely where the Father has placed every man. There are many men in Christ. In fact, there is every man in Christ, but every man must choose to abide. Every man must choose to bear fruit. Beloved, listen, God has done something that if we do not uh, believe and receive it, it will never be effective for us personally to the fullest extent of the experience. We are lacking in experience because of the poor exercise of our choice. God has done everything on his part. He has placed us in the best soil. Beloved, I tell you Jesus Christ is the best soil. He has placed us in the best soil, the choicest soil. So that the treasure that is placed in these earthen vessels may finally spring forth. The precious fruit of the earth may finally go forth. But there